Yeah, g'day, Pat Carroll here, and I'm joining Brad Beer on the Physical Performance Show. Uh, I uh, had to run around a fair bit uh, back in the uh, 80s, 90s. I was in the uh, Montegetti Di Costello era, and uh, I've got a couple more kilos on me these days, but uh, I used to run reasonably quick, and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to having a chat to Brad and, and for you all to uh, get a little bit more of an insight as to what makes Pat Carroll tick. And the winner is... Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Listeners, welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust, as always, you've been having a great week. And you've been out there making some gains in terms of your pursuit for your physical best performance. I've had a great week. It's been a full one, a busy one. Got two beautiful girls. My eldest is just shy of turning four, and my youngest is uh, a month or two shy of turning one. So my days are tricky, and uh, certainly, uh, like many of the listeners, I'm sure, who juggle work, training, uh, and life, and family, uh, it's a, it's a constant juggle. So I'm recording this quite late in the evening uh, whilst my beautiful girls sleep. So I hope I don't wake them up. If I do, you might hear a little baby cry or two. But I hope you've been enjoying, listeners, the previous guests of the Physical Performance Show, including last week's Bonanza, which was Dean Canazis, ultra marathon man. And didn't Dean share some absolute gold? Uh, everything from how he got into the ultra marathon world, that very unconventional marathon that he did on the eve of his 30th birthday, running uh, in a less than sober state down the freeway from San Francisco to Half Moon Bay. What a story that was, right through to the writing of Dean's latest book, Road to Sparta, and the challenges that Dean overcame in the Spartathlon, the 254-kilometer run from Athens to Sparta. And Dean, in that episode, episode 58, unpacked how he fueled his Spartathlon race with the ancient foods, if you like, of the Greeks. So that was pastilli, cured meats, olives and figs, and of course, water. So if you missed episode 58, be sure to jump back over. It's super inspiring. What an amazing guy Dean is, and you're going to really, really enjoy it. And prior to that, we featured Matt Poole, who took out his debut Kellogg's Nutrigrain Ironman series title on the beach earlier this year in Cronulla. So if you miss Matt Poole taking out his debut and explain how he persisted after 10 years of being in the series with highs and lows, be sure to jump back over to the previous episode with Matt Poole as well. Listeners, you're in for a real treat today, a little bit more on today's guest in a moment. But as always, today's show is lovingly brought to you by Pogo Physio. We are Australia's first fixed fee unlimited physiotherapy practice. And we do this through our unique two, six, and 12-week finish line programs. Why do we do this? Well, it's real simple. We want everyone that walks through our doors to get that high five moment where they've finished their rehabilitation. They've crossed their physio finish line. The significance of that is that we want everyone to start a journey and finish a journey. We don't want anyone dropping out halfway through treatment because of the limitations of session to session physiotherapy care. The beauty of the finish line programs is that Anyone that does a program on average gets between 30 and 40% more in value for services than what they pay for. And you know what? We love it because we love seeing people get back to their physical best and we believe we've done that through helping remove the barrier of session-to-session care and the associated costs of that. If you'd like more information on how to benefit from the Physio Finish Line programs, be sure to jump over at pogophysio.com.au and from July 2017, the Pogo Partners program will be launching whereby finish line programs can be coming to a practice near you. Big thank you to you, the faithful listeners who have left a review on iTunes. 
Reviews help this show get more visible in the ears of fellow peak performers who, just like you, are looking to perform at their physical best. And I wanted to specifically say thanks this week to Carl Fennon. Carl rated the physical performance show with five stars, and Carl goes on to write great podcast, original and informative interviews. If you are an endurance junkie, then I'd definitely give this pod some of your time. Carl, thank you, mate, for giving this pod some of your time, including leaving a review on iTunes. And listeners, if you'd be so gracious, if you've been enjoying the show to review the program, that'd be wonderful. You can do so from a desktop or a PC, unfortunately not your tablet or your mobile, over at iTunes, simply click in ratings and review. Today's guest is a marathon Australian legend. Now, on previous episodes, we've featured marathoning legends such as Mr. Steve Monaghetti and Rob DeCostella and Benita Willis, Nee Johnson. And today we feature Pat Carroll. Pat Carroll is one of Australia's greatest marathoners, one of only a few men to run sub 210 for the coveted marathon distance. And Pat's bio is really impressive. Uh, By way of introduction, Pat has been a four times winner of the Commonwealth Games Marathon in 83, 84, 88, and then 97. Pat took out the Beppu Marathon in 95 with a PB marathon time of 209, 39. Pat's represented Australia 18 times on the international scene, has been a Commonwealth Games representative on three occasions with three top eight finishes and Pat has a PB in the half marathon of 61.11 and has also twice been runner-up in the coveted Sydney City to Surf race. So it's an impressive bio, an incredible guy. Pat's also a current Gold Coast Airport Marathon ambassador. And in this interview, Pat takes us through the origins of his running, how he went from a debut marathon of 248 right through to his PB of 209.39. He also talks about how, as a junior, he didn't feel that he was anything special, nor nor were his results showing that he would be anything special in terms of his running. So he shares some great stories around that, right through to the highs of his career and the lows of his career, missing out on Olympic representation in the 96 Atlanta Olympics. Pat touches on that. And he also touches on some great training philosophies and some insights. And as a coach, Pat shares some of his best tips to help people get ready for any running distance, in particular the marathon. So Pat brings a whole wealth of experience, knowledge, and great stories to the podcast. So let's jump straight in with Mr. Pat Carroll. Listeners, joining me today, I've been really looking forward to uh, catching up with today's guest, Pat Carroll, for, for a long time. Pat, as per Pat's bio, is an Australian running legend and uh, certainly one of the faces that I always enjoy seeing here in Queensland at running events and in particular every year as one of the Gold Coast Airport Marathon ambassadors. So, Pat, thanks for uh, thanks for jumping on today. My pleasure, mate. I'm, I'm sure you say that to everyone you have a chat to. Mate, I, 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 I do, but different <laughs> different degrees. And I've had Pat, oh, quite right. a few people on the treatment table uh, who in the last 12 months have said, you should catch up with Pat Carroll. And so, mate, uh, this is as per listener's request, Pat. You're a man in demand. Well, I'm ple- I'm ple- it's great to know there's people out there who still still uh, know, of, know of me because uh, the, uh, the older you get, the, uh, the, less, um, uh, the, the less known you are with the, with the public. Do you, do you feel that that's a natural progression for all athletes? Is that something that, you know, is a, is a con- fear or a concern or it's just the reality? I think it's a reality. I, I, I uh, remember, um, uh, like, like I, always, I, I, I always bang on about Deke, right? Anyway, um, I was down the Gold Coast uh, maybe a few years ago and I had my, uh, my son there and a few of his mates. And uh, Deke was uh, at, a, at a table, a, a couple of tables away from us, having a, having a quiet whiskey in the afternoon. And I said to one of Tim's mates, I said, that's uh, Deke over there, Rob DeCostella. And he went, who? <laughs> and, and, like, who, who on earth in Australia would know who Rob DeCostella was, right? Yeah. But I think it's just a, uh, like a, a generational thing as you, uh, you get on, um, you know, unless you're, you know, right up there like a, a Thorpe or a whatever. But, uh, um you know, I, I was very surprised that even even someone 
of my son's generation didn't know who, who Deke was, but that's just uh, the way it goes, I suppose. The passage of time. I mean, I was out walking through the practice this morning and one of our therapists was talking to someone in clinical Pilates and, and our therapist, who's in her mid-20s, said, who's George Michael? <laughs> and, you know, so, <laughs> so maybe even if you do have the international star status, it's a passage yeah. of time thing too, Pat. But, Pat, what's one thing that scares Pat Carroll? Oh, I don't like when people park in disabled parking spots and they shouldn't be parking there. That, that, I don't know if that scares me or worries me, but it uh, scares me. Um, oh, I guess, I guess the obvious one, dying. Yeah. Uh, I'm not real, not real keen on looking forward to that. So, um, <laughs> uh, But that was, that was pretty much a driving force throughout my uh, running career because I, uh, I knew I was going to go, only going to uh, have one bite of the cherry. And uh, and I wanted to, that's how I I I wanted to um, use my running as uh, a way to leave my mark on, on the world. So that's what that's why I, how, how come I generated so much money, so much energy into my running was uh, I knew that eventually my body would slow, and uh, eventually I wouldn't be here. So I just wanted to do something to be remembered by. Yeah, wow. So you, you realise that you know, as you say, you had one one shot at it. And athletic careers are. You know, are cruel, aren't they? You know, you do have a window of time to get out and maximise, which is what this show is about, helping people pick well, up the insights into yeah. pursuing your physical best. So do you feel, looking back on a very impressive career, Pat, of which some of which we'll touch on as we speak today and, and others yeah. that I've identified in the bio, do you feel you extracted the maximum from your potential throughout your career? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I could have maybe trained a little bit smarter and, and not and, and involved a bit more recovery time. I did, um, you know, run around tired a fair bit and did race tired um, uh, often and, and also picked up a few major injuries along the way, so I lost a bit of time there. But, um, I mean, I'm, eternal, I'm, I'm, I'm forever grateful for uh, the opportunity that I uh, had and um, uh, the... The energy that I found, and 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 the desire that I was able to uh, channel into uh, the the sport of distance running, and um, you know, it was all a, it's all a, uh, you know, see how it goes sort of thing with me. I mean, I uh, I, I didn't um, ever anticipate that I would achieve what I did. I mean, you know, my first marathon, I broke broke three hours, and I thought, wow, that's that's sensational, you know. And um, so I wasn't uh, like a a childhood hero coming through little athletics that uh, you know winning races left right and center and always showed this promise and and you know a kid or whoever who had dreams of making the olympics or whatever um for me it was just uh you know just i'm just going to see where this takes me and um i didn't i didn't really place any massive uh expectations on myself i just uh i just wanted to be the best that i could be and and finish up feeling okay with um you know the what with what i achieved as per your bio at the start of the, the program today you know you went from a sub three to a 209 39 for the marathon yeah. uh in i believe that was your victory in the beppu marathon in 95 yeah. yeah. i mean uh you said you weren't necessarily uh, growing up with the expectation around you of achieving that incredible level mm. of performance was there a moment though through your uh, early years where the lights did go on and you realised what potential you actually had? Either either you realised it yourself because of a performance or a coach or someone around you came along and said, hey, Pat, do you know you got real talent? Well, I, you know, no one actually ever really said that to me. Um, uh, uh, um, I was training with a group of guys here in, in Brisbane and, and uh, they were um, more advanced than me and they just, they just uh, took me under their wing uh, and because um, I just used to run around, and they needed a runner for a, uh, a relay that was coming up, and uh, they asked me if I would join their team. Anyway, so I really looked up to these guys. I suppose I still do. And um, and and I thought, geez, these guys are bloody they're, these are superstar guys, you know. And I just kept training, kept training, and and then I just started beating these these guys that were that had groomed me or or had brought me on board and introduced me to actual running events and races and whatever which i didn't even know existed you know like my first fun run uh, i was out on a just a, a training run and uh, i came across a group of people and i said to this guy i said what what's going on here mate he said oh, it's a fun run i said no i didn't even, i said i don't even know fun runs existed so i <laughs> uh, I, I actually borrowed five dollars off this guy and actually went in the fun run yeah, that was right. my first that was my first um official 
race. And um, what year was it, Pat? Approximately. Uh, that would have been would have been early eighties. Early eighties. Yeah. Probably 80, 81 or something like that. Yeah. So you paid your five bucks. You borrowed it at that, and you went in your first yeah. fun run. Yeah, I don't even. I'm, I, to this day, I'm not still not sure if I gave that guy back his five bucks. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I went on this fun run, and because uh, I, I, I I was very heavily in the karate, so I used to run. Only reason why I was out on a run was because uh, I was doing um, you know training outside of my karate. So uh, so I was just running around, and um, and anyway, eventually I got a little bit disillusioned with the uh, karate, and uh, found that uh, distance running was. Um, uh, a lot more uh, suited my makeup, my personality, and, and you know I could just bowl out the door. I got a bit tired of driving to um, a place to go to training, and I thought, well, Jesus, running thing, I can just bowl straight out the door. So I just, um, so I just um, got more and more into running. Deke was going well, sort of inspired me, blah blah blah, and um, so I just, uh, yeah, just. Just put my head down and away I went. Yeah. And, and to put the perspective, uh, obviously Deke's been a, a prior guest of the program. Your listeners, if you missed Deke's episode, jump back, have a listen. But to put us in the timeline of this, uh, what had Deke done at that point, Pat, that it inspired you? What, what what had been some of Deke's successes at that point? Yeah. Well, funny enough, I oh, he'd, he had won, um, uh, he'd won uh, the Commonwealth Games in Brisbane. So... Um, I think I didn't know. I just sort of vaguely knew of him. Uh, I I, um, I went to the Gold Coast Marathon. That's right. The first year I ran my mar- first marathon I ran, which was around two forty eight. He was there as a guest speaker at the um, pastor party, and I heard about this guy, Dick Costello, whatever. And he was, and and I think he'd won he'd won uh, Fukuoka the year before, and he ran two oh eight. So he was sort of up on the Gold Coast. Um, I guess a guest of the marathon, but also getting in a bit of uh, training or getting used to running in Brisbane or, or wherever because it was leading into the Commonwealth Games. So I, I still hadn't met him, and I was still just a a, 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 a fun runner sort of thing. And Oh, I did this 248. But I can remember a story I went to, um, and I never thought I'd represent Australia, so I, a story I was uh, actually running to the Commonwealth Games marathon in 1982. So I left my mum's house, and I just ran like 5K into the city, to run to watch the marathon, and I was um, about a kilometre out from the city, and this ABC News car stops me and uh, says, "Mate, do you know where this marathon starts from?" And I said, "Oh yeah, yeah." So they so they said, "Can you jump in?" So I jumped in this ABC News car, and um, and the, drive, and they drive, I, I guided them to where this start was at South Brisbane, and uh, and I watched the marathon. But I often go past that spot. I was going, riding past that spot the other day where this ABC News car picked me up. And I'm thinking, little did I know when that ABC News car picked me up that day that I actually would end up going to three Commonwealth Games. You know? Yeah, wow. So, and, uh, so the whole thing was a bit of like, and even when I when they uh, this news car picked me up and took me there, well, I was just a a Gumby sort of a runner, just just going to you know watch you know the this Commonwealth Games marathon and looked at these international runners come past from wherever and just thought, geez, these guys are just absolute superstars. And uh, so I never at that point I never. Um, had the confidence to um, put myself in their shoes. And I can remember when I ran around a similar age, one of my aunties gave me a maroon, or maroon, maroon, maroon tracksuit, which is a Queensland colours, gave me that for my birthday. And I, because I started running sort of okay, and I, and I took, and I got this maroon tracksuit, and I said to my mum, I said, I can't wear this, I can't wear this, this is a Queensland tracksuit. There's no way in the world I'm ever going to represent Queensland. I can't be seen walking around in a Queensland tracksuit. You know? How old were you then, Pat? In the years? Oh, I would have been early early twenties. Wow! Uh, so I would have been um, twenty two. Yeah. So 22, 22, 23, and still not really having any confidence, or not really having any um, uh, awareness that that I might be okay. You know, for then it was just running, and well, I'd run two forty eight for a marathon, and um, I can remember being at my twenty first birthday and 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 sh- uh, showing people. A picture of me when I finished the marathon and, and just walking around at my 21st, going, look, look what I've done. I've run 2:48 for a marathon, and you know how, how great am I, sort of thing, you know. And I just thought, well, that's it. That's 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 as good as I'm going to get. But you know, I was pretty proud at my 21st to have run a, a 2:48 marathon. You know? and, and Pat, on that, a couple of things. Uh, one, I think it's beautiful uh, story of the fact that, you know. 
there's a matur- maturation of, of runners to hit their best. And just because you're not knocking the ball out of the park as a junior uh, doesn't necessarily negate the fact that you can go on to do extraordinary things. Uh, one, I want to know about how that's affected your coaching philosophy with now your uh, Pat Carroll online and online running group. And secondly, uh, what was your training like for that first marathon? Let's do that first marathon first, and then we'll talk about your coaching philosophy. So first marathon, Pat, what were you doing to hit that 248? Was it pretty rude uh, and crude? Gosh, that's a long that's a long time ago, mate. Um, I mean, I would have been doing the doing the long runs. Uh, you know, I suppose my training over the years hasn't really hasn't really changed. I would have raced a lot. Um, I, I did race a lot back then. I did uh, a lot of cross country runs um, every weekend. I'd be out at a cross country meet and I'd be backing up the next day with a um, a long training run. I don't think I'd started dabbling in the track then. Um, uh, it's possible that I. Um, I did, but I, I did. I did eventually start running track, but I don't think I started running track then. And um, yeah, I don't know. I was just very green, uh, just just trained with these guys and and did whatever training they were doing. We would have done one k reps, um, and we would have done some track work also, but uh, just a diet of one kilometer reps and um, track work and frequent cross country races. And uh, I think when I ran and went in the marathon, I, I still don't even think I. Um, Went in there with an actual goal time. I just sort of started it and just aimlessly ran this marathon and and uh, ended up with what I what I got. Knowing that you were a late maturer of reaching your potential, uh, has that how's that affected your you know philosophy as a coach? Coach now helping well, runners all, to achieve all, their best. It all does come down. It all, it all does come down to K's on the clock, doesn't it? I mean, uh, um, you know, you uh, you can be a um, a 30 year old and and you've been going hard for 15 years well you know chances are you you, you don't have any Im- much improvement left in you but you could be a a 30 year old who's uh, you know been focusing on a on a career and in, in whatever you know work career and uh and decide and just had this urge to start running well that 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 30 year old you know it's got the can can certainly um Im- improve as the years go by but uh you know your chances of of uh, being becoming an elite athlete when you you start at 30 uh, are much uh, less than than if you start when you you're 15 or, or 20 but you certainly you know got very very much an opportunity to improve the uh, less you know kilometers that you you have on the on the clock there yeah, yeah, certainly. Pat, uh, out of all the achievements, I mean, you know, as per your bio, they're extensive three times Com Games representation, uh, fifth fastest half marathon, 61.11 in 94 for Australians, um, an all-time list, uh, all-time marathon, fourth on the all-time list. So, Pat, of all the achievements, is there one run in particular or result that just stands above the rest for you that you would say in review of your career as your crowning glory? Which one and oh, why? Oh, it mar- have to be my marathon. I mean, um, uh, you know, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Uh, you know, I, I, um, the marathon is the holy grail, and, uh, and and I sort of started off as a marathoner, went to the track, finished off as a marathoner, and um, uh, so that's, you know, your, your credential really uh, when you finish up is, um, you know, your best, best time and also whatever teams you make and what races you win, but uh, certainly your time. Is in there, and um, uh, I mean that was a great race. I ran two nineteen. The, uh, the the guy who came second, Stefan uh, Frygang, he was the uh, bronze medalist from the Olympics um, two years before, and uh, also Densimo, the world rec- current world record holder, was in that race also. So it was a fantastic, you know, race run run for me that one. And I had a ding dong battle with uh, the the German over the last five uh, k, and I. Um, uh, I, I broke away, and the last my last 5k was the quickest. Um, it was I averaged. I was I ran under 15 minutes for my last uh, 5k. But the interesting story about that one is um, I uh, went over there to the Beppu Marathon as a uh, a pace runner because I um, I wanted to get into the race, but they uh, uh, weren't prepared to fly me there and put me up unless I would volunteer my services as a pace runner. And I said, well, look, okay. I'll pace the race up to 25k, and this was the second group they wanted me to pace. They wanted me to pace it a 2:10 group, and I said, "Well, okay, I'll pace the 2:10 group up to 25k." But uh, I just want to let you know that I've got every intention of uh, finishing this thing, and and uh, all the other runners knew that I was have every intention of finishing. Anyway, so got these 2:10 guys to um, 
uh, 25 k and I thought right now I've I've got a I can just look after myself now so I actually uh, caught the leaders at about 30 k so I was actually found myself in the lead group and uh, end up end up winning the thing so um, which was fantastic yeah. Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't a surprise that I finished because everyone knew that I was going to finish. It. And so that, so what were the race organisers? Uh, what was their response? Oh, well, they were happy because I, I don't think they had too many quick times there. I think Saron had run two eight uh, previously, but uh, mine was, um, you know, certainly one of the uh, a few times that anyone had broken two ten there. So they were. They were static at my run, yeah. I was yeah. very happy. Certainly. Yeah. And, Pat, uh, your uh, highlights from your three campaigns of your Com Games, what would be the, the highlight out of your Com Games representations, Pat? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, gee, I didn't really run it to my full potential, did I? So a um, bit disappointing, really. Uh, um, you know, most of my great running came in the in the cooler weather, so um, you think being a Queenslander would be a bit the opposite. But um, I... Uh, I definitely was in there for a strong chance uh, in uh, KL, um, and and I, you know, I, but I, you know, without making excuses here, I got really, really sick um, uh, months leading into it, so that sort of just knocked me, knocked me out. So, but um, yeah, but but a little bit, you know, disappointed, but uh, certainly thrilled with the fact that I did go to three Commonwealth Games, and um, uh, but you know, that's the way that's the way it goes, mate. I. Um, I was in the race that that Lordy won. Everyone, everyone, most people would know the race that uh, Lordy won the five thousand metres. Um, bugger the silver! I'm going for the gold. Well, I, I was actually in that one. And I, I led that one sort of bit, about halfway through, and um, uh, I didn't. Um, I didn't know Lordy had won, and because I was coming off the bend when he would have crossed the line, so um, I crossed the line. And, I'm, and I thought I was thinking, oh shit! I wonder how Lordy went. I'm a bit, a bit of the bloody, a bit you got a bloody medal, you know, and. Um, <laughs> Next thing I know, Lordy has got his arms up in the air and he's he's praying around, and uh, and he's got him up into such an extent that that's that's not a bronze or a bloody silver arms up in the air. That's a gold <laughs> silver up in the air. You know, I thought, oh, good on him. Yeah, bloody great, great run. It was a great run. And to put listeners, uh, those that don't know, Andrew Lloyd, Pat, that was uh, the year was 90. 90, 1990. So, and uh, one of Australia's great victories in distance running. And Pat, uh, Olympic campaigns. Mm. How, how did how did that play out over your career? I mean, you're mixing it with the best on an international stage, and obviously domestically there was, you know. Mate, I was just unlucky. I really unlucky. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, I went to four major championships. Also, went to a world championship. So, uh, I went to four major championships, and um, uh, those four major championships could have easily been four Olympic games. But uh, it just came down to timing and um, selection criteria and whatever. And uh, I was just really um, unlucky, uh, a bad timing or whatever. Um, I do carry a bit of a uh, gripe. This this uh, Beppu run when I ran two nine right. Well, the next year, uh, Athletics Australia said, "Well, we're going to have a trial, and we're going to make the trial the this Beppu marathon, right?" Anyway, uh, so I thought, well, that suits me, and and they were going to fly uh, Australians over there for this trial, and I thought, well, that suits me. And my agent contacted the Beppu race, and they said, "Well, we don't want Mr. Carroll." Because he's run here uh, two years, the two years prior, right? And um, so uh, I'd run 2.11 the year before and I ran and then I backed up with 2.9 the next year. And uh, so my agent said, well, they don't want you, mate. They said you can go there, but you're not going to get any money anyway. So I'm, I'm you know, mate, trying to make ends meet and whatever. And, uh, and here I am at the uh, peak of my earning potential because I just run 2.9. Anyway, I got offered 40,000 US to... Um, go to another marathon in Japan a, a month later. So, you know, what am I doing? Am I going to this one yeah. for nothing or am I going to one a month later for 40,000 US? And and, um, and I thought, well, I'll just I'll just take a gamble here and um, and hope that, you know, any of the Australians who go to this Beppu race aren't going to qualify. Anyway, uh, I was uh, – two, two guys who I respect uh, went there and they actually dipped just under – the 2.14 by, by 30 seconds and five seconds or whatever, right? Yeah. Anyway, so then they – so even though I had in the qualifying period a uh, a, a 2.9 and um, I also uh, had my 61 in there, 61 mm. half, and also in this marathon where I went for – got money for, I ran 2.12, I came fourth. 
So I had those massive performances behind me. They didn't take me because I didn't go to this bloody trial yeah. race. And um, it just, it, well, it, yeah, it's pretty. As when I look back, you know, I, I, I uh, that's one thing which I think I was really, I was shafted big time because they, um, uh, you know, basically said to me, "Well, mate, if you don't go to the trial, well, you know, we we may not pick you." And uh, I was unlucky because one of the guys only qualified by three or five seconds. So uh. if he if he'd run three or five seconds slower. Then I would have been a, a shoe in, you know. And that, and to put that in, but that was for the '96 Atlanta Olympics. Uh, yeah, this is all happening yeah. the year before in the trial period. And Pat, does time yeah. heal those wounds, or is that still something that you know? Obviously, you know, the contact I've had with you and the you know the the common people that we've both worked with over the years as uh, as at recreational runners, uh, you know, you're an optimistic guy, and you know, you, it's strikingly yeah. someone that just gets on and does oh, on the, the job. On the surface, it does. On the surface, it does. But when I dig deep, mm. I mean, I lost a brother last year. Mm. passed away John and um, so when I dig deep I go oh mate wake up to yourself you know mm. bloody you know um, you know matters could be a lot worse you know yeah and um, so that's what that's what I do but but initially you know I'll, I'll go geez that bloody pisses me off you know and um, and and uh, but you know I, I like I said I started off with the whole thing not knowing um, you know where it would uh, 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 take me and um but you know, like, like and, and I, in, in, you know, and you see recent recent times of selection of teams and how performances have um, have dropped, you know, and uh, you know, if if uh, if if I could have somehow slowed myself in the current <laughs> thing, I'd be I'd be bloody the first one bitten picked. Yeah, you know, uh, and they, and, they, and we're talking we're talking a period of bloody. You know, was it 20 years, you know? What's your view on the current status of marathon in Australia? I mean, obviously, we've had some incredible performances, you know, Michael Shelley yeah. winning, winning the, the yeah. Common Games. But as you say, the qualifying times have, have, have uh, you know, haven't kept improving with the pace of the decades. Uh, you know, I've asked Deke this, and I'm always this interest, mm. and I get asked this a lot from the physio treatment yeah. room. What's your yeah. view on... Uh, well, 219 is a qualifying time for the Olympics is an absolute disgrace. Yeah. Right? It's an absolute disgrace. Yeah. Uh, you know, why 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 make it easier? You know, like like you know, oh, we've dropped performances, so we better make it better 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 lower the high jump bar. You know, I mean, that's just an absolute disgrace. What do you think needs to change in Australian distance running? Well, to, to well, well that's, that's 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 I'm only, I'm only talking about the qualifying thing. Yeah. Right? Okay. State of state of Australian distance running. I mean, Michael Shelley is absolutely unbelievable, right? Such a such an amazing, such a great guy. And um, and and you know, whenever he races, he he really applies himself, and he's done incredibly well. Like he recently ran, you know, two eleven uh, thirty odd in um, in uh, London, and, and you know, he's silver and, and gold at the uh, the Commonwealth Games. I mean, he's had such a, a stellar career to date. So you know, we're very fortunate to have Michael and 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 the way he's been going. And um, there's an absolutely strong uh, undercurrent of um, you know, 5K, 10K runners that, uh, you know, have the potential to, you know, run really well over the marathon. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're very healthy. It just hasn't uh, happened yet. But, uh, you know, Collis Birmingham, uh, you know, he's, uh, you know, a very, very strong chance that he will run very well over the marathon. Um, I mean, let's look at Patrick Tiernan. I mean, in 20, 27, 29, a couple of days ago, and the guy's only 23 years old. Yep. He's built like a, I don't know, he's so strong. Looking, yeah. You know? Yeah, he's a strong, so, strong So, you know, he's, and he's only 23. So, you know, what's what sort of, he's just, an, if he can stay injury-free. Yep. You know, he's got an unbelievable, you know, future ahead of him. And I think another guy ran 13, 17 for 5K. I mean, I got, there's guys running, under 13, 20 for 5K, that I don't even know who these guys are, you know. They're just sort of uh, guys I've never met just coming through. So, And the women, the the, the females, uh, Australian ladies are just going absolutely sensational, probably as good as what we have ever had. I mean, certainly not up to Benita's standard, but uh, certainly, you know, incredibly um, strong. So the depth there with Lisa and um, Jess and... Uh, and and you know women there's just too many to mention so overall you know the uh, the women are going great at the moment men certainly there's a lot of great potential there you know Liam Adams is in there also I don't want to name too many names because I'll end up missing someone out yeah but, sure, um, sure Benson Lawrence Liam Adams you know all all uh, solid 
but they haven't done it though. You know, they haven't done it. So you know, we can talk about it, but yeah, but, but certainly that's another thing you can talk about it and what they've got potential to. But you talking about it and and doing it's another thing. I mean, I've seen a lot of runners come through over the years that have, you know, can run low 27 minutes for 10k but just can't convert it to a marathon so it's not a it's not a given yeah it's certainly not a given and Pat, no. on your marathon and you said you always ran better in the cooler weather was that because i mean i'd look at pictures of you and listeners or pop some pictures of pat with his uh running some victories and training sessions in the show notes and you know you're you're a strong build pat you're a strong runner um yeah. you know what two questions what was it that affected you in the warmer conditions and two what was your frame weight your body weight typically through the peak of your racing at well 68 kgs but uh, i had no fat on me at all i mean uh we'd be at the institute there and i we have this skin fold thing and i think the um i think i'm only i've got to try and remember here but i think 30 i think where they take different sites on your body and they use calipers anyway i think 30 was like ridiculously low and i think i was like in one of the only ones in the sub 30 club you know so i was actually the, the heaviest uh, along with Deke, we were both the heaviest of distance runners, right? Around 68, 69 kgs. Yep. So Mona and and Lloydie and whatever, they were 60 kgs ringing wet, you know. <laughs> and um, I think even lower, even lower, maybe under 60. Yep. But I had no fat on me, and I for years I couldn't work out. For years, you know, I'd, I'd go to the coast and I'd go for a swim in the ocean, or I'd go for a swim in the pool. And I think it's pretty freezing, you know. And then when I stopped running as much and put on a bit of weight, and I thought, Jesus, water's nice. And I realized, well, that was because I didn't have any fat on me. <laughs> I didn't have any insulation on my body. And um, so now I can go in the in the ocean and, and just uh, hop in there like a whale, you know. It's bloody nice. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I was – I was, uh, 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 but, you know, just the way I am, I'm, I'm built, I suppose. And, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, no, no fat on me, but uh, and and you know, being a bigger guy, maybe the uh, you know the heat because you you know you've uh, got to got to work a bit harder when you um, have to um, cool yourself down in the heat. Just didn't 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 work for me or whatever. But uh, I never ran incredibly great marathons in the heat. Although I did run two, did run reasonably well on the Gold Coast a couple of times. I did run really well actually in the Gold Coast a couple of times. But um, uh, more often than not. I mean, I just used to love going to Japan. I mean, I just got so much um, admiration for the, the the Japanese race and uh, race of people, not race, but race of people. And uh, and uh, whenever they put an event on up there, it's just, uh, you know, it's great, you know, cool conditions and easy to travel to. So I always managed to run well in, in Japan. I used to, you know, it was great. Yeah, interesting. And, you, and you're very understated there, Pat. You're a four-times winner as per your bio of the comp, of the Gold Coast Marathon with a 14-year break between your victories, 83 and 97. So you certainly did execute well in the, the warmer weather on the Gold Coast. Pat, you said at the start, in reflection, you might have trained smarter with your career. You know, you mentioned also some major injuries. What, what would have you done differently in retrospect? Well, I'll put, you know, I think uh, cross-training, whether it be... Uh, um, uh, I mean, I've seen now um, Galen Rupp, the American guy. He he does uh, a lot of work on a um, uh, underwater treadmill. You know, I think I think there's such great uh, benefit in in doing something like that. You know, I mean, running is running is as you know such a uh, demanding action to uh, stress to put your body under, and um, uh, and that's what often is uh, you know an elite athlete's undoing. They just uh, you know, something decides to go bang because you've overloaded it. But uh, you know, if you could, uh, it'd be great if you have a crystal ball, wouldn't it? To yeah. know, you know what what the what the what the ideal amount of land running would be for you, and then well, mate, you know, maybe that's your limit there, and we'll do the we'll do a few sessions a week on the underwater treadmill, or uh, uh, and and you know, do it and we'll do it that way. But uh, you always seem to just um, uh, you know live on a, on a knife's edge or whatever or play or run on a knife's edge you know that you sort of uh and all of a sudden bang you know you've just gone too gone far. too too much you know but so, you know, i think like like this underwater treadmill that's available now uh, that would have been beneficial and then you know then you when you you're not running around his leg tired as much but you're uh, you know you're still getting the the cardio workout from from running on this um you know gravity free environment so i think uh 
um, something like that would have uh, would have would have benefited something like me. Yeah, yeah and I mean, uh, you know, there's so many advancements, isn't there? And it is the art and science of coaching, and you've lived this now in your coaching career, and also as an athlete. And I certainly live at that coal face every day in helping the people I help in the physio room, paddocks, wanting them to advance, but not even wanting to go too far. And it's a it is an it's yeah. an art form and it's a science, isn't there? It's that endless. Pursuit. There is, a, you know, just really realizing what what the tipping point is, but you know. You know, underdone's better than overdone. So, uh, you know, most of the people I'm involved with, uh, I don't have them running more than four days a week, mainly for two reasons, you know, just to uh, want to get into the start line. And, and also most of the people I deal with are um, professional people and have families and whatnot. So, uh, you know, you want to keep a good balance there. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but certainly uh, underdone and getting to the start line is uh, better than uh, pushing your luck and not, not getting there at all. Yeah, and, and I think that's such a sentiment that I echo with too, Pat, in the physio context. This, you know, you've got the option of pushing too hard, not making it or getting there. And, and I think uh, so many athletes, just, you know, particularly the runners, Pat, the notion is more is better, more is better. And, you know, it's, it's having that control to not fall into that trap, isn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, you know, more is more you know obviously you want to stress your body and it's a tough like if you're talking marathon it's a tough event so we've got this thing in our mind that you know we've got to be tough in training whatever but um so you know you do run all these kilometers and you do end up being a um well i was an aerobic junkie i mean you know for me i just uh, i could never run enough you know any day of the week if someone said to me go and run a go and run a marathon well i could have done it yeah. you know i just uh, i was just ready to go and um and for, and and for me, it was a, a drug, and you know, I just like being, like the feeling that I had once I'd been for a run. Uh, so uh, you've got that sort of um, addiction yep. uh, there. That uh, um, and sometimes uh, addiction, uh, uh, you know, clouds over what what is what is sensible. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it is. It, it actually has that uh, true uh, biochemical effect on our on our brains with the serotonin and the dopamine. Yeah. Pat, we're going to shift gears. We're going to do an interval session. We call this a performance round, and I'm going to throw at you a bunch of rapid fire questions for your first off the cuff responses. You ready? Oh yeah. Training session most disliked, Pat? Uh, by me? Yep, as an athlete. Never. I always em- embraced the opportunity. I never disliked uh, anything. Bring it on. Beautiful. Training session most loved? Uh, I used to do a 15-minute um, a effort where I'd uh, just started a, uh, a, a post and, and uh, run towards my house and, uh, and pre-garments, pre, pre-sat-nav watches, and I'd just um, uh, try and get as close to my house as possible or, or a bit past it, and i just... Uh, Someone's letterbox would be my PB mark. <laughs> Beautiful. Favorite pre-race meal? Uh, oh, I'd have to be pasta. Uh, just keep it simple, mate. Um, spaghetti uh, pasta. But but mind you, um, the uh, night before I ran two nine, I had a uh, sizzling steak. Uh, two beers and um, a uh, large bowl of ice cream. Did that tempt you to repeat that for future marathons? No, not really. I think I was just lucky I got away with it. <laughs> Mate, uh, as an athlete, bedtime and morning time, were you fairly disciplined around that? And what, what would they have looked like? Oh, yeah, probably 9 o'clock. And, uh, you know, I've always loved the mornings, always loved early mornings, so always probably up up at – and being a Queenslander, you know, you always run, run early, so uh, – Probably in bed nine o'clock and up at uh, four thirty or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. out the door. Who's the athlete Pat you most admire and why? Oh, Rob DiCostello because he was such a uh, um, colourful personality back in the day, and he just uh, just oozed uh, commitment and uh, dedication, and uh, uh, his whole persona was everything that the um, the marathon was about. His uh, sense of commitment and. Um, uh, he's uh, visionary to uh, to be as as great as what he's to be as good as what he could be, and uh, just tunnel vision. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Is there was there a mantra that you used to use, or some sort of self talk that you would, you know, consistently use across your racing, Pat? Yeah. Relax. Stay relaxed as you can. And um, you know, I was I was watching that sub two attempt the other day, and uh, is it Kipchoge? Is that his name? Yeah. Guy, Elliot yeah. Kipchoge. Yeah. Yeah. You just look at him, and he was just—he was just—he was just—he um, was just so peaceful, wasn't he? Yeah. He was just so peaceful, and and a lot of that would have come from, you know, I, this is this is the persona I'm going to embrace 
This is a persona I'm going to embrace here. The other two guys have dropped off right from the get-go. They were all over the shop, weren't they? And you could tell they were in pain or whatever. And, and I'm sure this Kipchoge guy, he would have been uncomfortable. But uh, but he just he just kept that sort of um, uh, relaxed thing. And I would say to myself, you know, stay relaxed, stay relaxed, stay relaxed. And, uh, um, you know, just you check in with your body, you know, how am I feeling, how are the legs, how's the lungs, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, just, um, you know, as you go along, everything's fine. Tell yourself everything's fine, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah. And, Pat, one word to describe your racing style. One word. Oh, honest. Uh, you know, even when I used to, um, uh, I never went in a, I don't believe I ever went in a race uh, to um, just win the thing. And, uh, uh, and whenever I, you know, fronted the start line, even if it was a Mickey Mouse fun run here in, Brisbane, which I was, you know, winning left, right, and centre there. I just, I would just want to run as quick as I could. No, none of this sort of, um, you know, jogging in a pack uh, when it was easy and and just take off. I would, I would just, uh, you know, go from the go from the gun. You know. Yeah, straight out of the blocks. Your best recovery tip, Pat? What would that be? Uh best recovery tip. I uh, probably, um, oh, two probably time and massage. Uh, um, you know, as the older you get, the more time you need, and uh, and and massage is great. Uh, I used to love hopping into a hydrotherapy pool in uh, Canberra when I was down there. Had this massive hydrotherapy pool, and uh, the jets were just so strong. I mean, uh, it was just that was, I found that very beneficial to um, have the strong jets on my legs after a session. And how would you describe Pat being in the zone? Uh, yeah, just like our Kipchoge mate the other day. I mean, you know, there is there is no tomorrow. Um, I can remember when I, uh, um, after my career, I uh, used to help a few guys out, and I was pace. I was just pacing a couple of mates up at the Noosa, um, up at the Noosa uh, half marathon, and uh, just helping to run, run under eighty minutes. So I'm pacing this eighty minute group, and. Um, and you know, there's not much, not much chatter. It's all pretty quiet. We're all running along and whatever. And and uh, and this guy goes, um, oh, um, what what race, what marathon you got coming up next, mate? Or what what half marathon you got coming up next? And I just piped in and said, hey, mate, how about we just focus on today yeah. and uh, and not be too concerned about you know what's coming up in the future? Yeah. He, he he shut he shut up that thought. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I was trying to I was trying to think. I was I think I spoke on behalf of everyone else yeah. in the group. Yeah. Going, mate, look, this is what we're doing. Yeah. There is no tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. We're we're channeling everything into this this next. We're channeling everything into this eighty minutes or whatever. Yep. And uh, you know, if you're going to bring that negativity to, the, to we don't want that sort of negative not as negativity, but we don't want that sort of distraction, um, lack of focus or whatever. Uh, I mean, obviously the guy was just trying to take our minds off what we were doing there, but. Um, I mean, that's the exact opposite. I mean, there is there is no tomorrow. There are no other races. You're not you're not chatting about you know your training. You know, how's your training been, mate, or whatever. I mean, I've, I've I have paced three hour groups and whatever, and people start talking about their training or whatever, and I'm pretty quick to say, mate, yeah. I bet you pipe down and just uh, focus on what you're doing right now, and don't worry about what you know. Yeah. What's well, it? When were you last in the zone, Pat? Last time Pat Carroll was in the zone. In the zone, oh, mate. Running wise, um, you talking running wise? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. A long time ago, I suppose. Um, I mean, I finished up uh, in uh, early two thousand. So uh, yeah, a lot, lot of water on the bridge since then. So I don't, I don't actually have any um, hunger or desire to um, uh, to uh, uh, extend myself in in running now. I mean, I still run. I run most days. Yeah. At my running group, but. Uh, I don't have any desire to um, to to push myself. Pat, uh, what's the hardest training session you ever did? Oh, uh, I don't know. Probably Sunday long run. You know, I mean, we uh, I, I often talk about Canberra here, but um, you know, we uh, used to run over this incredibly hilly course in Canberra on a Sunday morning, and uh, that was very, very, very taxing and. Um, We'd, we'd run very strong up these hills and uh, uh, looking back now, you know, used to take it for granted and, uh, you know, but now I probably wouldn't be, able, wouldn't be able to run up some of these hills even if I started fresh at the bottom of it, you know. 
and you know we're and we're we're attacking them after two hours or whatever you know yeah wow so um but yeah just the the long run but you know you just embraced it and uh and you know it was nothing you you didn't dread it um it was just uh it's what you wanted to do with your life at that point in time you know it was uh a stage of my life where i couldn't run enough and uh um, I just uh, embraced every opportunity to get to get better and better. And uh, that long run would have been what somewhere between thirty and forty kilometres, I'm assuming. Mate, pre sat now watches who who, who, knows? who knows how far we ran, mate. Yeah. Who knows how far we ran? Who knows what? Who knows how far we? How fast we're running? Who knows <laughs> yeah. how far we ran? You just were I running. Mean, you're in the you're in the bush. Yep. You're in the bush. There's no there's no way we could have measured the thing. Yep. You know, I mean, we wouldn't have had a clue. You know, we used to call it 35k. It could have been. Could have been 32. It could have been 38. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, fascinating, isn't it? Pat, uh, mate, some listener questions that have come through for Pat. So I'm going to throw these at you, and then there's a, a few questions to land the plane. First one from Connor Lynch. What are some of the other components outside of running specifically that Pat Carroll would recommend an athlete focus on to help them be their best? Oh, well, I mean, I mean, there's diet. I mean, I, I don't comment on areas that I'm not... Uh, um, uh, trained in, but uh, I mean, diet you can't go wrong there, and uh, there's a lot of great nutritionists and uh, that you can consult with these days. Uh, and um, uh, so, diet, um, you know, re- recovery, like I mentioned before, uh, if you can get your massage, um, uh, what else? I mean, um, I mean, you've got to be happy, so you've got to have a you got to you got to be have a good good social life and good family and good workers. It's got to be good balance. I mean, it's got to, it's all comes down to balance, doesn't it? So uh, you got to be on top of your running. But I think it's important to be on your top of your running rather than your running being on top of you. Yeah, nice. That's, uh, that's nice. And um, but uh, you can use that one if you want, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'll always quote you, Pat. <laughs> Pat uh, L L asks here, uh, what's Pat's advice for getting back to competitive running post overtraining? Oh yeah, um, you know it depends what what's burnt out your head or your body, you know. Yeah. Um, so I mean, time is time heals all. Uh, it's a matter of um, you know if maybe you need to have a break. If, it, if we're talking marathons here, then maybe you need to have a break and just drop down to half marathons for a while. If you're talking a half marathon, it's a bit burnt out. Drop down to 10k for a while. Um, but uh, you know, setting setting goals, maybe treating yourself to an overseas marathon and uh, having that to train up for, um, you know, that may be a, an incentive to get your depends. You know, it depends. You know, f- to, you know, there's a bit of a fine line between mojo and and fatigue. You know, what is it? Have you lost your running mojo, or or are you burnt out because you've um, you know, smashed your body and you've run, you know, three marathons close together, whatever. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's a matter of um, stepping back and go, well, what is the issue here? Of I uh, am, am I physically tired uh, and and need a bit of a break and and maybe don't race for a while and just jog around, or or um, or am I just a bit over this and and uh, you know, my 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 head's gone a bit and I lose a bit of my running mojo and. Uh, do I maybe need to, um, you know, lock in some more exciting goals or, or change events or whatever? Yeah, great. Pat, uh, question from a listener. What what portion of marathon training should be dedicated to speed work? I'd say 20%. 20%? Thanks. I saw, I, saw, I saw a great, I saw a fantastic study once where they, uh, and they, they call 2080 polarised method, right? So, and that's, that's hit home to me. Well, you know, whatever I've always preached, well, you know, it's it's definitely the way to go. So they got this study of these endurance athletes, and I think they were cross country skiers, cyclists, runners, and I'm not sure if there were swimmers in there also. But this guy did this presentation. I was watching on YouTube, and he said we got them all, and we put them all in, um, you know, where one group did, um, you know, most of their running at a, most of their training at a solid pace for 80 percent of the time, and 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 20 percent jogging so you know where this is heading right <laughs> so the the group the group which did you know, you know and they had groups which do this steady running you know this uh you know threshold type running a lot or training or skiing or whatever you know where they're they're sort of uh you know they're not jogging but they're not flat to the boards either a lot of this sort of steady state sort of running which people sort of go on about these days and uh anyway lo and behold out of all these these groups they they had 
I don't know there's other factors here, but the group that did 20% intense work and then just jogged around the rest of the time overall improved more than any of the other groups. Yeah, wow. Well, there you yeah. go. Interesting. Pat, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's an insight. Uh, Rich, Ricky says, can't wait. Great choice. What's Pat's first tip to staying injury-free and continuing running? Pat must have some great advice after decades of high mileage. What's your one tip, Pat? Yeah, well, there's the, there's the crystal ball, isn't it? So you need to uh, be able to uh, foresee what is uh, too much for you and you just um, – uh, you just delve a little bit under that, but unfortunately we can't get this crystal ball. But uh, um, you know, I, I think uh, you just got to build on where you're currently at. So you know, have a good, a good, a good look at yourself. You know, what have I been doing lately? Um, you know, how many years have I been involved in this sport? Uh, you know, how much can I increase it before something's going to go bang? And uh, you know, back in my early days when you know, I ran this, these 248 marathons, whatever, I had stress fracture after stress fracture, you know, and um, only because I was just doing, you know, far too much. I had four four stress fractures in the, in the period of a couple of years. Of what body part, Pat? What body part? Oh, uh, tib and fib. Yeah. Both tib and fib, yeah. Yeah. And um, so just below the knee in both legs, that's your, that's your tib, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it is most likely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and your fib, your fib, uh, just above fibs, just above the ankle, right? Yep, yep, perfect. Yeah, so so both legs, both both places in both legs. I had stress fractures. I was going to say, you must be reading the listeners' questions because Lachlan then asks, I heard a story that Pat worked so hard cross-training mm. in the pool while recovering from a stress fracture that he injured himself. Would like I to did. know how hard Pat had to push himself in training to, to get the most out of himself. <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing. I was a very honest trainer. so uh, And I, I uh, didn't need to um, be running with someone to push myself. So... I had a lot of guys I went through that that you know wouldn't couldn't uh, do a fast session or even a long run unless they were meeting someone. Whereas with me, it was never a problem. I could I could get out the door and like I I could drive 20 minutes down the road and hop out of my car and go and run through the forest for three hours by myself. It didn't bother me. Yeah. I could go and run, you know, um, bowl out the door and go and do a speed session and uh, you know 20. 30 second efforts and just totally smash myself and I would even get to the 20th one this is uh, and go well you know how, how much how bad do you really want this and I'd do another two or three or four right uh, because I thought well you know do we got to get to 20 and I'd often often be a bit I go oh that's right I've got the 20 now I'm going to say to myself I've got to do another bloody four you know <laughs> and uh, <laughs> anyway so um, uh, anyway so I, I'd do the extra two or three or four just to prove to myself yeah. But, uh, you know, how much I really wanted this, you know. And, you know, to stop then was the easy. I wouldn't. If I went for an hour run, I'd run for an hour. I wouldn't stop at 59 minutes and 10 seconds. I'd run for an hour, you know. And uh, But just quickly, that, that, that story, it is true. Um, I, was, I was injured, Achilles injury. I had an operation. I was in the pool and um, totally smashed myself in the pool and uh, doing all these efforts and whatever. Anyway, go out of the pool. <laughs> You know, you can go for a run now, mate. Just go for another, just go for a five-minute run, rehab. Anyway, bloody incredible pain in my hip. Cut long story short, I gave myself a stressy in the hip from uh, all the pool running I was doing. But I, I was, but I was, I was really smashing myself in the pool like big time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You, you just intensity-wise and, and time-wise, you were just put, putting it out. And I mean, the forces of the water. I, it's, I actually got asked this question from someone uh, on social when they knew we were catching up, and I'm like, well, technically, you wouldn't think it's possible, but let's find out. And you know, knowing your commitment to your uh, training, it's obviously it, it happened. Yeah. I don't know whether this is true or not, but the doctor, I mean, sometimes doctors are quick to diagnose why something happened. But uh, when I went to this doctor and he goes, well, mate, you've got a stress in your hip. And he just quickly, quickly, he came out with, uh, well, and, and you're, you're cleared up on this, but he said, well, when you, you've run over the years, Pat, and you've uh, developed stress lines in your bones and these stress lines have uh, become stronger and stronger. So because they, they're used to the action that uh, running uh, 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 takes and so therefore um, your bones are um, stronger than someone who hasn't been running for years because they've got these stress lines in them and these stress lines uh, are used to force at a certain angle. Anyway, he said, but what you've done, Pat, is you've gone into the pool and you're doing, you're bringing your leg up into your your hip. You bring the ball of your um, yep. uh, up, up into the hip at a different angle, Pat, yep. at a different angle 
and the stress line in your bones are not used to this particular angle. Yep. And that's why you end up with a stress. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely, Pat. Absolutely. You're putting yourself in a you know, hip impingement position and jamming it up and going and flat out by the sounds of it as well. So, oh, I was, yeah. So, Pat, thanks for enlightening me. And uh, when I get that asked uh, that question, I can give people the answer about Pat Carroll now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they were so excited when they saw the, the x rays and they went, oh, this is so great. You've got a stress fracture on the head of your femur. We've never seen this before. And you did a pool running. It's yeah. sensational. There you go, mate. You've left your mark permanently on sports medicine. Yeah. Last question from a listener, Pat. Jennifer asks, what does Pat do for nerves or what did you do, you know, at your peak of your racing before the race in the first 5Ks? Oh, there wouldn't be any nerves in the first 5K. So um, nerves would be before. So uh, it was always a relief once the gun went off. So I, uh, in the days leading in, if I became anxious, which, you know, if you don't, well, you know, you're not human. But uh, if I became anxious, I would actually tap into the feeling that I would get once that gun is fired. And because, uh, so, I, you know, I used to use up all this energy leading into events and I'm thinking, what am I doing this for? You know, I'm doing this bloody training. And then I start losing it a bit a few days beforehand and uh, and obviously I'm negating some of this training I'm doing because I'm, I'm, I'm often fronting the start line feeling a bit wasted from not sleeping a couple of nights and whatever and, you know, this is not right. Anyway, so I, uh, I uh, said, well, I thought to myself, well, you know, I never feel nervous once the gun is fired and I'm in the race. And that was like uh, it was like a, um, oh, it's, you know, the waiting's finally over, I can just get on with this sort of thing. And uh, so I would actually tap into, when I was at night trying to get to sleep, I would tap into that, that feeling that I would, I would get once the gun was fired. <laughs> and, uh, and, that, and, and how I'd go, I'm relieved, I'm, I don't have to worry anymore, um, I don't have to think about it anymore, I'm actually, I'm, I'm in there, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm inside the room or whatever, you know. And uh, so everything's happy, everything's okay now. So that's what I would do. I just would picture, would visualise myself in the race at the start. And the the gun is fired. So I never once was I nervous during a race. Yeah, terrific insight, Pat. If you could boil down your years of elite level racing, your now you know incredible track record as a as a coach, and give listeners aiming to to get their best out of not just their running but whatever their physical endeavours are, what would be the one bit of advice? If you could only espouse one bit of advice, what would Pat Carroll's single piece be? Well, if you have a passion, you know, go for it. You know, embrace it. Uh, you know, um, it's it's uh, that's something that money can't buy. That you uh, have a desire to run a marathon. You have a desire to run a half marathon or whatever. I mean, uh, there's a lot of people who don't have that desire, and it's not just uh, you know some people do it as a bucket list, which um, is hard work for them. I feel sorry for people who go. I've got a bucket list to run a marathon, but, you know, they're not actually, um, you know, passion true about. distance runners or don't have a, uh, a passion for the sport. So for them, it's hard work. <clears throat> and um, I do somewhat feel for those people because they go, oh, I just hate these long runs, you know. <laughs> yeah. I can't stand it. I can't. One of my buck, you asked me what, what things that, that's, just start off with saying what do you. Well, one thing that's Pat Carroll's scared of, yeah, scared of. Well, I suppose it's not scared of, but what I hate is that when people use the word hate. <laughs> that's, I mean, you know, I have sometimes with my running group, I've had people come up and, they, and I'd have them in the session what the board is and they go, oh, I hate that session. And I go, poor choice of words, mate, poor choice of words. You know, what's this hate business all about, you know? And um, I mean, you should embrace the, 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 the challenge. So, uh, but... But you know, if if you have a, if someone has a, a true passion for something, regardless of what it is, then that should be embraced because you know that's that's not something that you can go and buy. It's not something that uh, someone can convince you to have. It's something that's that's uh, in your makeup. And and like I said, we're only here once, so you know you've got to make the most of that uh, current passion that you have. I started playing guitar four or five years ago. Bloody love it, mate! I just love it. I could not. I cannot play enough of this guitar, right? Yeah. And 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 that's not something that uh, uh, someone has um, convinced me to do. Uh, it's not something that um, you know, uh, or whatever. It's just something that I think I'm going to do this, and I and and I and I want to be good at this, you know. And I have this, so this this uh, um, I don't know this. Uh, 
in a in a strength that I have to to a desire is I think is a great thing. You know, it's 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 a, it should be embraced. Pat Carroll, what's on your bucket list personally and outside of sport? Uh, yeah, back to the guitar thing. So, uh, you know, I want to uh, excel at uh, playing guitar. So I'm, I'm about halfway through that project. So five years down and uh, come and see me another five years, mate, and I'll be shredding it. <laughs> you, you might be the performing act at the uh, Gold Coast Airport Marathon, Pat. Forget Maybe. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, Pat, I, do, uh, I do have visions of myself emceeing events with a guitar. There you go. Well, mate, I'd, I'd sign up for those races. Just a question <laughs> on the guitar interest. Is yeah. that something, a passion that you always had, but you always deferred because of your uh, necessary focus on your athletics? Uh, no, always uh, always loved music, always been a big big fan of music. And um, uh, I did dabble in guitar a little bit when I was um, uh, in my teens, but I, that was a bass guitar and I only did bass guitar because I thought four strings would be easier than six. But uh, um, I, I think it was, I always had in the back of my mind to do this guitar thing and then I... Uh, remember Paul McCartney saying that uh, it frustrates him uh, with when uh, people come up to him and they say, "Oh, you know, I wish I had, uh, um, you know, dedicated myself to learning the piano." And he used he said piano, so I wish I dedicated myself to using piano. And he said he's seen those same people ten years later saying to him, "I wish I dedicated my time <laughs> to learning the piano." And he said. In that ten years, those people could have learnt the piano. <laughs> yeah. What a what a what a profound insight, Pat. Uh, uh, listeners that want to find out more about you know your your journey and also your uh, Pat Carroll uh, online coaching and uh, online coaching, where can we find out more? Where can listeners go to get more information? Yeah, well, just uh, patcarroll.com.au. So uh, I just uh, I don't actually focus on uh, elite athletes. So I deal with uh, everyday people. Uh, people who have careers and families and uh, and uh, and have the um, time availability to run four times a week yep. and uh, but you know want to uh, lock in some goals and uh, so I personalize the training programs I do online so I take into consideration where someone is is currently placed and uh, and build on there and I am honest with someone so if someone came to me came to me with who was very green and wanted to run a marathon or a half marathon and they short time frame that I, you know, even I wouldn't be taking their money. I'd be saying to them, well, no, it's not going to happen, you know. So so I do, uh, I'm very honest and upright with someone whether they whether I think they should be allowing themselves more time. But uh, people do benefit from, uh, you know, they're involved with me online because uh, when they report, report in, it uh, provides accountability and, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, knowledge on the net where you can, download all these all these free training programs but they don't uh allow for um the the um the freedom to involve short-term goals along the way so anyone will tell you when you're training for a marathon or a half marathon then you're going to have events and races along the way so and, and these events and races they're going to be falling on different dates and whatnot and um I'm yet to find anyone who's got one of these free online training programs where where it just goes well punch in here whenever you want to do your races and we'll just get the computer to automatically spit out the rest of the training, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's what I do. I do encourage people to um, involve short-term goals and, uh, you know, sometimes people are crook and they have a week off or two, so you need to rejig. Sometimes people go away on holidays. Some, sometimes people do shift work and, you know, all that sort of thing. So that's why a personalised touch uh, certainly does um, Make a difference, help. absolutely. And, uh, and I have my running group, uh, PCRG, I work out of uh, South Bank uh, uh, three mornings a week, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. We leave at 5.30 and uh, getting some good strong numbers there at the moment. i uh, getting close to 70 people mm-hmm. on a Tuesday and it peters off a little bit Thursday, Friday because uh, um, for whatever reason, but I uh, get, get closer to 30 people on a Tuesday and a, on a Thursday and a Friday. But, uh, yeah, well over 70 people on a Tuesday at the moment, which is a great atmosphere and uh, always involves 20 minutes of uh, – tough running which i encourage people to embrace and not hate uh and uh so so it's it's 20 minutes of tough running in the middle and just a great positive uh environment yeah and pat uh certainly i know many runners who i've uh 
met over the years who have taken part in those and everyone speaks so positively of it so it's a credit to you and certainly mate we'll see you at the upcoming Gold Coast Airport Marathon 2018 version you're one of the um, faces the ambassadors that most people come to know and love um, yeah. what is it about GCAM Gold Coast Airport Marathon that you particularly love Pat? Oh well being a, uh, a born and bred Queenslander and uh, that is where I ran my first marathon there back in 1982 so uh, geez we're a few years down the track now aren't we but um, uh uh, you know, I just and, and just such still get a buzz going down there, and uh, it is the premier marathon in Australia. So uh, we're looking at. Uh, I'm not sure when this is when you'll air this, but uh, when, as I'm talking to you, it's uh, less than eight weeks to go. So we're probably closer to six by the time you um, yep. load this onto the 200,000 listeners, <laughs> but on you on iTunes. But um, yeah, it certainly is the is the run is the one to run is the uh, the Gold Coast uh, Airport Marathon and uh, the 10K and the Half Marathon. Uh, just, uh, you know, you know, Marathon and Half Marathon, 10K, they're all tough enough on their own, so you don't need to throw any hills in there. And um, so that's the beauty of the Gold Coast Airport Marathon. It's, uh, it's on the Gold Coast and it follows the coastline all the way. And uh, as we know, a coastline's flat, so uh, there's no hills at all. Yep. Uh, there's a couple of little little bridges. things you go over canal canal bridges, but that's they're nothing. But yep. uh, but yeah, it's certainly dead flat, and um, you know great conditions, uh, and you know just and and the Cameron Hart and his team at uh, Gold Coast Events put on such a uh, first class uh, show, and uh, the race precinct is uh, second to none. It's got such a great vibe about it, and uh, yeah, just um, you know bring it on. I just can't looking forward to it less than. You know, and there, and the it's always the first weekend in uh, in July, and um, I've never heard anyone say a, a bad word about it. And uh, I certainly anyone who's listening to this, I'd certainly would uh, um, you know invite them to uh, lock it in. Yep. And, uh, and and run down the Gold Coast the first weekend of July. Yep, and if you're listening in and you're interested in the event, be sure to check it out. We'll link up that as well as the Pat Carroll Running Group uh, in the show notes, listeners. And finally, Pat, what's Pat Carroll's physical challenge to listen is going to be for the week? So, Pat, this could be something entry level or extremely difficult. Uh, you get the the right to choose. What's it going to be, Pat, for people that are listening? Oh, let's do let's do some let's do some hill reps. So I think uh, everyone. Regardless of their uh, ability, uh, can um, you know uh, tackle a, uh, a hill rep session, and uh, and and you know 30 seconds is a uh, a good length of time to uh, uh, run up a hill, and um, so you know obviously the more advanced you are, the further up the hill you're going to go, but uh, you know run run top up the hill 30 seconds, and uh, come back down as uh, as slow as you can. And uh, do that, do that 15 times. And uh, for those who aren't as advanced, they could have a, maybe a bit of a break after their tenth one and uh, finish off with um, uh, five reps. So I think, so I think, yeah, I'd invite everyone listening uh, to involve a bit of a warm up, maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then uh, find a hill that uh, is uh, not that steep. Like you don't want to be using grappling hooks to get up it, <laughs> but uh, but you know something that's uh, still it's still a challenge. Yeah. And uh, and, uh, yeah, 30 seconds uh, is, is good distance. Run back down, go back and do it again, yeah. Brilliant. So, listeners, if you take it on, jump online and let both Pat and myself know. And Pat can be found on Instagram at Pat at, sorry, at PCRG underscore running. We'll link that up, guys, in the show notes. And, Pat Carroll, I just want to, mate, um, say firstly, thank you for your time. Secondly, uh, I know you've, as you said, you're suffering a bout of the man flu and not feeling your best today. So, mate, thanks for pushing through. That's all right. For uh, being that That's honest right. runner that you are. Are, that honest athlete pushing through the yeah. pain and also mate you are one of the faces that i've come to love at the gold coast airport marathon every year and when i've seen you at events and commentating and the energy and the passion and the the lift that you give to any event i'm ever at mate it's something that i admire and appreciate as a as a runner myself so mate i think your career stands alone as an incredible role of accolades and um and mate the fact yeah. that you're still in there loving the sport giving so much to it i think is one of the really great examples of just how life-giving you know endurance running is so mate i just want to acknowledge you and say thanks very much for your contribution well i appreciate that brad but i think we are uh, fortunate that um I'm, I'm extremely fortunate that i've been able to continue to make a living out of uh distance running and um you know i i uh you know if anyone i'm dealing with it's just you know all you have to do is be the best you can be, whether it be to run a half or a four for the first time or doesn't matter how long you get 
takes to get from A to B. But uh, it certainly is great to go down the Gold Coast. And, and what I do absolutely love is uh, emceeing events also. So I do MC a number of events uh, around the country. Uh, I'm doing the Mother's Day run this weekend. I'm doing the Sydney Morning Herald half marathon uh and it's uh, in in a couple of weeks time so it's certainly an absolute joy to go to these large events and to be the person on the microphone and um jeering people up the start and being on the mic at the finish line and uh and you know i've got a good sense of feeling about what people f- you know feel when they come down the finish line there so i try and make the the finish line try to make the finish you know exciting for them and uh which is um you know it's certainly a thrill to you know start off as a average runner go through an elite runner and uh and now to be an ambassador for events like the gold coast marathon and also to uh mc events which is just an absolute thrill i mean to be on the finish line of the sea to surf which i which i always have been for the last half a dozen years to be going crazy for um six or seven hours on the microphone <laughs> and um it's just an absolute joy mate Oh, you do a great job, Pat. Mm-hmm. One of my favourite calls I've heard you make is our remedial massage therapist here at Pogo, Satoshi uh, Ishida. Satoshi Ishida! <laughs> Absolutely brilliant, mate. <laughs> Pat Carroll, you're a sensation. Have a great day, mate, and thanks again. Thanks, mate. Listeners, there you have it. Another episode of the Physical Performance Show in the bag. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please let both Pat and myself know what your number one takeaway was. Was it a training tip? Was it just something that was informative? Or was it something that was just uh, inspirational or otherwise? And Pat's handles can be found over along with the rest of the show notes over at pogophysio.com.au. And be sure to drop Pat a message. That would mean a lot to Pat and also myself. Thanks again to those listeners who have left reviews, as I said at the top of the show. If you're yet to leave a review, I'd love one. It helps this show become more visible, and it's such a thrill to see more and more physical performers picking up this program, putting it in their ears worldwide. We've now got a worldwide audience, which is a whole lot of fun. And I I love getting feedback on uh, how the the program's helping people, keeping them inspired to stay out there pursuing their physical best. If you'd like to subscribe to the podcast, it's really simple. Simply click subscribe from within your app or your device, and that will automatically populate the show each week into your device of choice. A big thank you, as always, to the good folk who bring this podcast to you, Mr. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, and Susan Wilkin, our show's VA. Big thanks, guys. Your work's exceptional. If you've been enjoying the Physical Performance Show and you think you know someone who might also enjoy it, please do me another favor, on top of leaving a review, that is, and tag them in. Share the notes, copy and paste from your phone, and uh, share the URL also. And uh, share it around, sharing's caring, and that'd be fantastic. Lastly, if you're into running and you would like to injury-proof your body and go on to enjoy your best running, then be sure to check out my Amazon running and jogging bestseller, and also now available on Audible and iBooks, You Can Run Pain-Free. It's 330 plus pages packed full of my five-step method, which over the last 11 years of physiotherapy life, I have seen work time and time again for runners who implement the five steps. So you can run pain-free, available on any online book retailer or in physical print from the bookshop near you. And listeners, if you are looking to run a marathon in 2017, perhaps you've been inspired by Pat Carroll's journey and his sharings on today's episode, then look no further than the Gold Coast Airport Marathon. It's coming up across the weekend of the 1st and 2nd of July, and it features a smorgasbord of great events. It's my hometown race, one of my favorite events in the calendar. Absolutely love the Gold Coast Marathon weekend. It's dynamic, fun, Generally, always great weather and uh, an awesome atmosphere. You can run the 42K marathon, 21-kilometer ASICS half marathon, 
Southern Cross University 10K Marathon, the Star 5.7km run, or the Zesty 2km dash. So an event for everyone, the Gold Coast Airport Marathon. It's an event that I love to give my support to. And if you'd like to check out more, jump over to the Gold Coast Marathon website and you'll find all the details to get your entry in. Listeners, coming up next week on the Physical Performance Show, we catch up with another Australian running legend, a runner who is setting the international scene on fire. And this is Lisa Jane Waitman. As many of you may know, Lisa just ran an incredible run in the 2017 Virgin London Marathon, finished a terrific fifth place with a career best time of 2.25.15. So Lisa is looking very good for the years ahead. And in this episode, Lisa shares around how she juggles family and training commitments, how she juggles a career up until recently, or how she juggled a career up until recently, and also aspirations looking ahead, including the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games in 2018 and further further ahead. So you're going to really enjoy Lisa Jane Waitman. She shares earnestly and really transparently. It's a great story of success and you're going to really take a lot out of Lisa's sharing. So until next week, keep pursuing your physical best. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show. Hold up. 